One of my motivations for starting this podcast, The Life After, is to be able to find myself by looking at my past. One of the people that stuck out is my friend Caleb. I've known him practically his entire life. I was his camp counselor when he was in kindergarten. So I brought him on the show to talk about things like, how is his life different now without religion? Politics. What was it like being brought up without a father? And also, how to reverse engineer a chart at a Christian bookstore to find better music. I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. Welcome to the Life After Podcast. This is Brady Harden, uh, and here is my co-host. I'm Chuck Parson. Oh, I like that. That was nice. Hey, Chuck, uh, before we get started <laughs> today, uh, we have an interesting guest. Uh, it's a friend of mine named Caleb that I've known for so long and grew up in the church that I grew up in, but I, I have a question for you first. Are yeah, you, are yeah, you ready hit for me. This? What is the most niche thing that you remember from your Christian world, from your Christian life, like 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 niche, niche. like specifically Christian. Like yes, only a Christian. Like take us down to the deepest, darkest portal <laughs> of your Christian like <laughs> pop culture world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Oh gosh. Uh, okay. So I feel like I think we kind of touched on it uh, in the last episode, but um, I like my dad was really into the end times. Um, yes. yeah like like left behind but left behind was like just the tip of the iceberg you know <laughs> for my family yes. it was like anything that was end times uh was like was like in our house your family was, all was we owned it yeah it was like we had it um there were like i mean like it was almost like your house was <clears> the <throat> island of patmos if you've ever seen the first two left the left behind movies that were like pr- Christian produced, not the not the Nicolas Cage one. Before those, okay, I remember that one is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but the other two, um, like imagine in times movies like lower budget than that. Like yes. I remember the specific uh, one that that I that I watched that we had. It's probably still on VHS at my mom's house. But there was this one shot that I remember where there was supposed to be this lady talking on like a, a Megatron type okay. screen, but you, it was just real obvious that it was just like oh, a video no. that was pasted onto, you know, a, a long shot of a, of a, of an actual it Megatron. Was probably, it it was like the answer of a Craigslist ad. Yeah. Like <laughs> local apo- post-apocalyptic movie in need of co- like college student to superimpose. <laughs> woman talking on Megatron. yeah no actually yeah um and it, we just had like there was a, there was one called the omega code that, i remember that one you're familiar yeah. with that one I think uh, we it, like that mixed episode. the yeah. bible code thing mm-hmm. that was really big in the 90s with with like the end times and uh and we had the left behind movies um and we had all the books and i had the kids series and uh, there were at least th- there were probably at least three or four movies i wish i could remember what they're called but that nobody's heard of Mm-hmm. That were like produced probably by some, you know, medium sized mega church in like, you know, Nashville or something. That became a thing, didn't it? Like Flywheel and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like like small time productions. Um So I was in a show kind of like that. Um the church I grew up in, there was a group of, of high schoolers. They got together, they were <laughs> they were all homeschooled, no offense. Yeah. Hey, um, you know. And they, they write they wrote a the sitcom about what it was like being a Christian in high school and I was in it. And then like we made this show and it got distribution and we actually are on air. Yeah. I think we're still on at like three o'clock in the morning. No way. Is it still on? It's still on. Yeah. I knew yeah. you were like on, but I didn't know it was like still Still on somewhere. Yes, That's yes. Every- and actually, have friends that I met because of being on that TV show, on that weird, that weird cable show. 
I can't believe there's still Christian cable. I mean, I guess that yeah, I guess there are. It's not weird. Christian cable networks besides TBN. I mean, TBN is forever. Well, we are on JCTV, which was TBN's youth station. Okay, okay, cool. And then also some places oh. in Ireland, Canada, and Africa for some reason. In Africa? Do you know what my most niche thing was that I can remember? I'm just picturing like, <laughs> just like little, little African kids like in their with, city. You know, like yeah, yeah. like. Like let's watch let's watch the yeah show. like gathered around the the like the CRT television, um in like their you know used like some American kids T shirt, you know in like Kenya <laughs> yes. yes in like Nairobi like oh yeah what was the show called it's it's four o'clock in the morning it's time to watch completing Caden <laughs> it's four o'clock. Hey man, it's like two in the afternoon there, so it's that's that's, that's how cable prime works. time. It's prime time television. Oh, is it? It's three o'clock, no matter what. I think so. Yeah. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is a revelation for me. So what about oh, you? revelation? It's your favorite. Yeah, it's my. I know all about it. Jk. Um, my most niche moment was when I was seven years old. My parents got divorced. Uh, my mom sent me to a Dr. James Dobson focus on the family basketball camp for kids who were going through divorce. <laughs> it was a weekend thing up in the city. And like oh, I was on, and, no. and honestly, and coming as a, as a, as a white kid from suburban, your parents couldn't focus on the family. So we will. <laughs> okay. Funny thing. Um, <laughs> A year before my parents got divorced, we were in our church's Easter pageant and we played a family whose parents, whose dad left them. Like we didn't have, it was like during a song and we went up there and we acted it out. Like my dad had his briefcase as he walked away and like we had to run up and give him a hug and then he's like pushes her. And it was like prophetic because literally a a year later, here we are, dad's walking (laughs) out. And mom Wait, is so like, this, uh, this was before all of that. Yeah, this oh, is like a man. year before it. And then, um, and then you know, a year later, my dad's walking, and my mom's like, I got to send him to Dr. James Dobson and focus on the family basketball camp for kids who are going through divorce. Oh, no. Which, okay, I, I, I do not criticize my mom at all for doing that. I think it was a very loving thing to do and actually helped yeah, me in a lot yeah, of yeah. ways. Um, one of the weird ways it helped me was I think it was my first interactions with uh, kids who were or people of color. Because oh, growing no up, because you I grew up from. in Arnold, yeah, well, yeah, I had uh, Arnold, Missouri, which is as rural as it sounds. <laughs> it's not that rural. It's pretty rural. rural. Um, I, I did have one one friend who was black in in my second grade class, and we were like best friends. But outside it, there weren't that many people of color growing right. up, and so that was helpful. But uh, do you want to know how good I was at basketball? I yeah, won, tell I won, me. I won an award, Chuck. Hey, you found your you found your your niche. Oh, in my niche story, in my niche story. Yeah. Um, I won the award. I won was most Christ-like <laughs> on my team. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, mo- so most improved the Christian most. Improved yeah, it's, it's like, what? hey, you're really bad at basketball. We yeah. like you. You know that was, <laughs> and 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 I, I feel honestly, like that's kind of deceiving, right? Most Christ-like. What about the other? I, I bet some <laughs> other kid was like that, like had the New Testament memorized, was just behind you, like, God damn it, and just like. Through his, <laughs> you know, like slammed his basketball down. Yes, Doctor. And they were Thompson. like, "Now, see, that's why you didn't win, Billy." That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, Poor Billy. But the bad thing that came out of it was uh, a, a month later. It was around <laughs> Halloween. My church was having an event, and we had a basketball set up inside. And and some kid was like a bigger kid. He was like, you know, like a jock. He's like, hey, you want to play basketball? And I was like, yeah, sure. Because I was like <laughs> riding off the confidence uh, that I got from Doctor James. So I played basketball. I slipped on ice. Yeah. I hit my head on the ground on the floor of the fellowship hall at my church so hard it dented the floor. I got a concussion. Whoa. My stepdad, who's hard of hearing, was in the basement and he heard it. <laughs> But it was before he was my stepdad. So like when my 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 mom and him started dating, and that's when he knew. Yeah, he was like, "Oh, that was your kid." <laughs> yeah, right, right. And so like they had like this big prayer thing. I was out of school for a while, got a concussion. The dent oh is gosh. still probably there, uh, but it, it gave me too much confidence. But then later on, I played basketball again, and guess what award I won yet again? Most Christ best player? No, yeah, no, no. Most Christ like? No, most. Look at you go, and that's and you know. Then you were well on your way to being the pastor that you dreamed of being. Absolutely, and yeah. here and here I am now. Made me the man that I am. Speaking now. of when you were a pastor, yes, or a youth pastor, or I guess a, just a counselor. Even maybe. before that, yeah. yeah. Um. So today's guest is my friend Caleb. I was Caleb's camp counselor when okay. he was in kindergarten. 
uh, he was reading at a fifth grade reading level. I always had to throw that in because I want people to think that my friends are smart. And uh, we had such a huge age gap between Caleb and I, but over the years, it just became more natural of like, oh, we're just friends because we're like in the same generation now, you know? Right, right, right. Uh, but I wanted to bring him on today uh, to talk about kind of like how our paths intersected, how they interacted, and also how they grew apart, and now how they are back together again. Right. Um, so right after the break, we're going to talk with my friend Caleb and stick around for the rest of the show. Cool. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at the life after dot org. We would love to hear, hear from. Uh, let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear from, from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. Uh, welcome back. Uh, this is Brady, and with me is my co-host Chuck. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, and here in the studio we've got Caleb. <laughs> Caleb, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hey, everybody. Um, glad to be here. <laughs> you sound like a really cheerful puppet. Yeah. It's like, hey, guys, Hi. I'm Gerbert. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I want to be the little donut. What was his name? Uh, Duncan. Duncan's Donuts. Yeah. We're really, uh, we're really getting into the niche Christian stuff. Oh, yeah. Salty. Yeah. Do you oh, remember God, Salty? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, big let's, psalm book. let's stay on top of right, guys. All right, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Salty's like, Salty is a can of worms that we can't afford to open right now. <laughs> I, you know, I would not be surprised to find like a poster of him somewhere in your house here. Oh, oh yeah, no, not in this house, but definitely somewhere in my mom's house. There wow. is also probably a salty children's Bible. See what we did. Yeah. See what we did. See what we yeah. did. That was you. You brought I up know, salty. Right. Caleb, um, how do I know you? So, um, as you said before, you were my camp counselor when I was a kindergartner. Mm-hmm. Um. And then I think the next time we really had interaction was on the cable show that you, that you were talking about at the top of the uh, show. Complaining, Kaden, yeah. Um, and we did that. I was like, how a, were you involved? I'm trying to remember. So at did. first I was like an extra, like a bit part player. And I did like the, the whole thing with that set is everybody did a little of everything. Very true. So I did some crew stuff and then I was there pretty much all the way through. And I did a little bit of writing mm-hmm. at the, at the very end. And, Played kind of a bigger role in the. We did a series finale. That's right, and you like played a, like two different roles. Yeah, yeah, and I wrote a little bit of that, and um, and then uh, I guess we had a gap of time after that where we weren't. It's not that we weren't friends, but we just. Well, I you, went, you went off to college. I went off to college, yeah, and, and, and high I school married. and then college, and you got married, and uh, and then in college you you went through some. Th- not in your college. When I was in college, you went through some things. Mm-hmm. And I reached out and said, hey, man, you know, love you, kind of that kind of stuff. What was um, I going through at that time? Was that my divorce, I'm assuming? Yes. And then, uh, yeah, I think that was one, what it was. Okay. For okay. sure. So that's how we know each other. Um, and we are kind of bound by this um, this Kimmy Schmidt sort of uh, emergence from the same, the very same church, um, in, in our early, uh, friendship. Very true. And did you, uh, did you ever go to any other camps? Uh, did you, did you go to Bates Creek? I did go to Bates Creek and you were a counselor at Bates Creek. I was your counselor there too. I couldn't remember. You, you you were the teller of the fabled John Bates story, which Uh, is like a, a camp tradition every year. So the idea was that the camp was, uh, built upon this old man, it's his uh his farm and then he passed away and it became a church camp and so we had like these really bad ghost stories that we would scare kids with because you know we have to have fun yeah. right and what better way than to scare children yeah in the middle of the woods and it's ghost stories are the thing you can kind of that's the kind of titillating thing you can get away with at a church camp basically did you ever do church camp chuck oh yeah oh so many so yes. many church camps. Like overnight ones or what kind of things did you do? Church camp? Oh, uh, week-long ones, weekend ones, leadership ones. Yeah, mixed bag. Yeah, load them up, man. I, I did it all. <laughs> yeah, 
I'm, I'm in adult. the same there was place. This, one of my favorite memories is like there was this one year my, my Baptist church went and we pulled up to the retreat center. And the first thing that we saw was this like giant five foot fish. It was just like a what? big, it was like a fish statue or something. Okay. And we were just like, oh no, where <laughs> are we? <laughs> but it ended up being the best one because there were TVs in all the rooms oh, and the what? counselors didn't know that. So oh, man. We, How we did they not know? TV all night. Anyway, that's, that's church amazing. camp, man. I did, I did everything from the like roughing it, um, kind of Bates Creek style, like in the woods and there's just cabins to like um, week long conferences on, on college campuses. Yes, and okay. being being an indoors kid, yeah, as I, I th- as I think all the people yeah. at this table <laughs> are in some form, uh, yeah. those were my favorite, yeah. the college campus ones. When you get older, you just call being an indoors kid, uh, you just call it depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it is. I'm, <laughs> right. I'm kidding. Hey, I get I get out. I just want to be the resident like outdoorsy guy who likes to hike and and run. And Do you have that? Good for you. Oh yeah, well, I like to hike. At no, times, I have to get yeah. out. I have to get out of the house. That makes sense. Um, I got you. So. What was your walk like then? I mean, so you you were brought up in the church. Uh, I knew you. So you had all these different influences of like your youth group, all of this. But what what started to change for you? So I guess my story is kind of a a tale of two churches kind of deal. Oh, that was good. And then a a tale of no churches. (laughs) Um, But um, I, I was never I was never what you would consider, I think, a good Christian. Okay. Um, I think definitely looking back, it was, it was a, uh, talk the talk kind of deal. Um, but yeah, I grew up in, in one church, we'll call it church one Okay. for the purposes of this podcast, uh, from like age five to 16, maybe 17. And that's where 16 I 16 probably. Cause I think when I got my driver's license, I stopped going <laughs> to church one. Okay. So I was always going with my family before. Um, and then church two was, um, 16 to like, I was only there for like a year and a half. Okay. And then, and then college happened. And that's where things started to go. Yeah. I think it was probably late high school. Um, senior year of high school. I don't imagine that I went to church a whole lot. Okay. Um, Yeah. We'll definitely get to that in a little bit. First, I kind of want to like see what, uh, what did your church life look like? What did your faith look like? Um, cause one thing that I've noticed is everybody's path is so incredibly different. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was, I was very, very involved. I was very conservative. Whereas Chuck, you, you were extremely involved, but you, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely conservative in, in most ways, but not probably not on the level that, that you guys in your, in your Southern Baptist background mm-hmm. were like, I was more in the, in the mega church, uh, scene, uh, yeah. which is a little bit more like. Uh, a little bit more, I guess, open and mm-hmm. accepting of <laughs> different kinds of people. Sort of. You know what I mean? Well, it's funny because when we were getting set up, you know, Caleb and I were talking, and Caleb used a phrase that you had never really heard before. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what was, was it? Uh, milk's milk. Oh, he milk a, before he was a, meat. He was milk a milk before person. meat. Yes, yeah. I don't, yes. I don't know. Yeah. And so what it was is like the about, as yeah. Southern Baptists, like, <sighs> tell me, tell me if you could relate with this. I feel like. With growing up, there was maybe 15 conversations that we would have, and they would just come in different orders and just be the same ones over and over and over, it felt like. Oh, so yeah. one of the really popular ones was um, that you would go to a church and you wanted to feel like you're being fed, you know? Okay. And yeah. and you were questioning, should I go to another church or should I say this one? And, and depending on what kind of person you're getting advice from, yeah, they would say— like a big thing. That's a big thing, right? Yeah, yeah, being fed. Um, yeah. Southern Baptist Christianity is like a video game in a lot of ways because you are all about leveling up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the the milk to meat you thing. Get some exp. Yeah, the milk yeah. to meat thing is like you start off and you know you're doing the fundamentals and you got to kind of learn the ropes a little bit and then but then you ratchet up to you know uh, hot dogs. <laughs> I guess right. the, the middle like you know, the cut up one. Yeah, dogs. cut up hot dogs. Yeah, right. Where you can you can kind of uh, you can kind of explore some more um, complex ideas and it it really I mean that's the way that I always interpreted it is like and so a lot of things that I would hear is like well you get out what you put into it yeah and or uh, they only feed the milk from the pulpit because you're responsible for your walk and feeding yourself meat at home and your quiet time or whatever just Mm -hmm. all these just really right right. but I think what's interesting is that. and what you know, we'll probably talk about this later, but um, 
a lot of the things that I was hearing was about developing yourself as a person sure. and me, me, me and um, yeah. reading my Bible and praying for myself and my family and um, witnessing to others, which is still a very me centric thing, <laughs> winning souls for Christ, sure, sure, which yeah. is the most disgusting phrase I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> but then, but then you, um, you know, obviously don't want to put words in your mouth, but you were talking about kind of the church you grew up in and it's, little a little more service oriented a little more community oriented yeah yeah and yeah. i've kind of found that um with exploring like just recently um uh i have started working well i, I was working with a unitarian church and a, a group called oh, cool, Met yeah. metropolitan congregations united and it is, this is like an awesome superhero group yeah yeah you know? and it's uh <laughs> unite and it's not religious at all, but they, they just whips? they just meet in churches, I think, because it's an easy place to meet. That was um, not a whip sound. That was a mutual high five. Oh, okay, okay. All sorry. of them at once. I was like, I don't know why they have whips. Okay, go on. <laughs> anyway, I'm Wonder Woman, track. maybe. Um, so, so my walk was uh, in church. I was v very much the poster child, I think, um, in my youth group. At least I was, you know there an hour early to help set up and there an hour later to help take everything down yeah, and yeah. at every event. And I was, you know, um, our youth group was very big on like, uh, multimedia experiences. So they'd make these actually pretty funny videos and they were good, good, good videos. Um, and I would be a part of that. And I was just always wanting to, you know, go on all the trips and do all the things and, um, I had all the friends and the youth group was very much my life. Um, right, yeah, yeah. For several years. Well, and one yeah, thing, I mean, when you say that phrase, the youth group was my life, like, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. It was and like... It, I don't know what your youth group was like, um, but with ours, it was very... It was led by very funny personalities. Oh, yeah. And so, kind of, like, a big virtue would be having a good sense of humor and be able to be witty and funny. Okay. And you're... you're were hilarious or you are hilarious like especially growing up like you always been kind of like witty and and, and on your game right way, so, so i i kind of rose to the top in terms of it was very hierarchical i think it was um and so i kind of rose to the top and could hang out with the quote-unquote cool kids because like i was funny yeah yeah like brady right totally. guys um but that that was a big part of it was uh, goofing around and being able to roll with the punches and make jokes was kind of a thing. And um, yeah, so that, that hierarchy was definitely, if not, that. if not explicit, was definitely subconsciously ingrained. What mm -hmm. about your youth group, Chuck? What kind of things did, did you find you, your youth group like emphasized? And um, yeah, so um, it was, uh, it was actually like the cool kids in my youth group were the ones that, uh, that like really did the, did the church thing like they re like like people that really like listened to the sermons and responded to them like it was not weird for us to like have discussions about what we like learned sort of like it was like uh, at the time I saw it as really healthy but now I mean looking back like I see the 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 uh I guess it was a two-edged sword but yeah um yeah no it was like like you like the more righteous almost you could be the more the like more legit you were the more respected you were in the youth group yeah wow, that's and weird. it was like the the outcasts were what would normally be the cool kids in that scenario so like kids that were like getting into trouble or like that cursed a lot or that like you know were in were like in dubious dating relationships or something like that were like uh so and so's like you know, messing up again, you know, it was like, oh, no. weird. it was weird. Yeah. yeah. It was like, I mean, it was, it was like, that's almost opposite because those kids kind of ran the, ran the, uh, ran the place. Did they? Yeah. yeah. I think well, that's I mean, how it is at most youth groups. This was kind of a weird, a yeah. weird spot. Like there was a lot of like, it wasn't weird for us to just go hang out with the youth pastor in his office for like hours. Oh yeah. We, yeah. We had, did you yeah, do yeah, that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, cool. And we, we had different youth pastors at the time. Right. I mean, how, how old are you now? You're 20, 23. Three. I'm 31 so yeah. there's almost like a 10 year age gap almost um right i think like in english we'd call that eight eight yeah, years yeah, i think in, <laughs> in modern mathematics in modern mathematics eight years apart um it, so it was different but it definitely had that attitude of i always felt like i was in, in a lot of ways i was as like a leader and i was involved in all these but i always felt like i was on the outs and it didn't really ever fit in mm -hmm. i think a lot of it was because the the people that were my age were all girls and i wasn't and there was always that weird 
gender gap and all of that and expectations. And so, um, I think that was, I think that was different for us. Like I, I, I always felt like I was the outs cause I took things seriously and yeah. I wanted, um, which is weird because I mean, that's, that's what the sermons were on. And so it felt weird to like stick out like a sore thumb because I wanted to, to actually follow right. what was being taught to us, you know? Yeah. There was a really interesting balance. I think, um, a lot of the like cool, funny guys, um, were top of the pops as mm-hmm. far as the hierarchy goes, but they, in a lot of ways, were also the ones who, I think, were kind of thought leaders as far as spirituality goes. And if I remember correctly, you you went to a different church. Yes. You you left Church One where we where we grew up. Yes. Um, and you and you did that during high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like uh, like yeah, like I said, I think after I got my driver's license. I kind of stopped going for a while, a couple months, and then I was like, oh, I don't feel guilty. Uh-huh, of course, yeah, how yeah, you do. And I was like, well, I need to get back. So I went to this, this church too. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that one. What was that transition like? Yeah, so um, this was a build as a non-denominational church, but was planted by all people who grew up in Southern Baptist churches. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was effectively a Southern Baptist sure. church, part two. Um, but it was more like a community church kind of deal. Okay. Um, and I was only there for like a year and a half, um, cause this was at the end of high school. Um, and the end of your faith walk and the well. end. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't, I don't know. It wasn't bad. It was just kind of nothing. Yeah. Um, it was very, very surface level. A lot of the problems I had was uh, again, it, at this Second church, I got very involved with the cool kids, mm-hmm. or what I thought were the cool kids. So I would hang out with people. I mean, it was just kind of a repeat of, of church one. But the thing I kept noticing is that on Sundays and Wednesdays, um, it's funny how I can say Sundays and Wednesdays, and like this audience for this podcast knows what that exactly. Means. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but Sundays and Wednesdays they would be all about church and and the, the sermon and all that kind of stuff. And then would just have the wor- most rancid behavior like the rest <laughs> of the week, like sure. just backstabbing and like just being awful to each other. Yeah. Um. And so that was so a big. You felt like it was. It wasn't like they were like going out and partying and smoking and doing a bunch of drugs or something. It was like they were on. They were like terrible to each other. Absolutely not. In fact, the opposite. It was they. They all judged everyone and all their friends super hard. And it was like, like this. They were all on their own little pedestals. Like, yeah, yeah. Pointing yeah. at the other. Yeah, it people. was this panopticism kind of thing where, like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> is that a? That's why I get college kids to come on the show. Who is that? Ben- is that Bentham? Is that Who is it? Who's who's Panopticon? I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm just... Optimus Prime. Optimus. <laughs> someone <laughs> someone will Optimus. someone will comment it in the right. comments. Anyway, Jeremy um, Bentham. No, stop. No. Uh, <laughs> Killing me, Brady. So anyway, there was a lot. the The whole uh, vibe was everybody's very much judging everybody else, and it was just a very like bad environment to be in. And that was kind of where my my exit re- really definitely started. Um, yeah. The one big moment. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. That's that. I think you're heading towards what I was. Gonna yeah. Say. The the one big moment I really remember uh, actually doesn't have anything to do with that, but it was this sermon. Uh, at this at this church too, um, that was a, it was a youth group sermon on a Sunday night, I believe. Uh, and this guy was a new pastor, pretty young, and he was just the whole thing was like, you know, make sure you pray and read your Bible, and man, you got to go out and witness to people in the cafeteria. You know, yeah. when you're at the football game on Friday night, you need to be out witnessing to people. And I just had this like, is this it? Right, like right. pray and read my Bible and quote unquote win souls for Christ. Like that's it. Right. And it wasn't the fact that it was this one sermon. It was, this was like the fourth or fifth sermon that I had uh, heard that, that month that was like, yeah, you just got to pray and read your Bible and witness. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, we, what else yeah, is yeah, there? Yeah. We well, get I think, it. I think in addition so, to tithing, there really isn't that much right. that I would hear sermons on from church one from that from that first uh-huh. place that was uh-huh. yeah yeah so I, I keep hearing you guys you you saying specifically uh uh 
talking about witnessing mm-hmm. was that was that was like a really big thing huge, huge. In both churches it was the thing that's it that's yeah. a huge that was it Baptist. yeah that was it okay yeah. it's the thing yeah. w- winning souls for christ is the thing so um so let's hold on so then. there's would you say there's i mean obviously there's pressure to go out there's a quote yeah it's like yeah so it, absolutely it feels that a lot of those things start to lose their meaning uh whenever they're being said over and over and over and they don't they, they just don't mean anything after a while you know mm-hmm. um so i want to talk about this right after we take a short break uh stay with us and we'll hear more from caleb extra extra read all about it why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast i'm not i'm telling our listeners about the blog did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce yes we also have a blog on the lifeafter.org post about starting over after religious trauma but don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra, and you can read all about it on the lifeafter.org. Ba-dum, bum. Welcome back uh, to the Life After Podcast. We're here with Caleb. He was just telling us about one of the last draws that he had before he left the Christian faith, um, and that was the sermon that it was just basically the same thing that you've been hearing over and over and over and over from your churches, correct? What were, what were the big things that he touched yeah. on? Pray, read your Bible, and, and witness. And witnessing was like the the big big to do so that kind of interests me uh because i like witnessing was something that that was talked about in church a lot growing up um with me but it wasn't i feel like it was more emphasized oh, wow. with, oh, with yeah. you guys with the is it like a southern baptist thing for huge, it to be i mean like, it's the thing yes. that it's it's the the reason it's evangelical christianity that is that is the thing and i, I remember yeah. a lot of times feeling self-conscious of like this doesn't come natural to me. So I felt like I wasn't a good Christian or I had to really force these encounters. And so they yeah. felt strange to me. Um, in fact, towards the end of my Christian career, um, I was involved with a church that whose sister church was very involved in street preaching. Yeah. And they took me oh, along and, yeah. and I really like what, like with signs in a soapbox and that kind of thing or, or they, more would, like... they would do a soapbox. I don't know if they would necessarily do signs. Um, and and they they were more level headed than like I, I feel like the first thing we think of are the crazy people who go to college campuses and stuff and just have like you all are going to hell signs. Sure. It it wasn't necessarily that bad. It had a little bit more tact than that, but mm-hmm. not much. Not much. Um, right. But I, I went out with them before and I felt so uncomfortable, and and I thought it was because there was something wrong with me. Right. But I look back at it and it's like no, it's because I'm a I'm I'm, I'm I that's not reality it me. always it seemed like every because i was a part of i hopped around churches a lot from from middle school to like college how I, many do you think you went um to? i probably have been a a part of i would say 10 or 12 churches double digits All yeah right, nice. okay. maybe that's a guess yeah i no, really totally. don't know but yeah i've been i've been in and out of a few and it, it seemed like there was always like the one or two people that were like really good at it and mm-hmm. you felt bad because you weren't, you were like, well, why can't I talk to people about Jesus like them? And there was like a, an amount of guilt involved, you know? Uh, and if it wasn't guilt for that, about? it was because you weren't spending enough time reading the Bible. It was because you did. Right. I, had, I had a pastor who told us straight up, if you're not spending over an hour and a half in the Bible every day, then you're just pretending. Yeah. Like, I was just absolutely pretending thing. then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, I had I had this one pastor, and there were two moments with him that were very instrumental to my exit okay. from the church. And it's not because it's not because I was at odds with him. It's because... I really believed what he was telling me and really loved it. And then the church like asked him to not be a pastor anymore. Okay. But one of them involved witnessing where we were on a mission trip and passing out like food to some homeless people. Um, and some of the people, some of the church people on the mission trip, church families were like, Hey, we need to be telling them when we pass out this food, like, Hey, we're doing this in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, just kind of give them the, uh, the long short of it. Right. And this pastor was like, mm, maybe what if we don't do that? Right. Maybe what oh, if right. we just do a good thing for people just because it's what we're supposed to do as sure. Christians. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I can get behind that. Right, right, right. And then the other one was, um, we did this, uh, summer camp, um, uh, at a, at a college campus and, um, we had a, a worship service. Usually you have a worship service every night at these things. 
And it was the worship service, and I was watching everybody. You know, the music was swelling, and they were falling to their knees and raising their hands and closing their eyes and singing and everything, and which is something that I had done before because that's that's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. But this uh, this particular time, I was looking around and I was like, "Oh, this is fake." Yeah, like this is. You're it just was just like, like it just hit you. It was just like a light switch. Like something right. inside of me was like, "Oh, this isn't real." Yeah, and mm-hmm. um, so I kind of pulled this pastor aside, same guy pulled him aside afterwards and said, Hey man, like I didn't feel anything during that. And and in fact, now that I think about it, I, I don't think I've ever felt anything. Mm, mm-hmm. And he basically was just like, uh, yeah, yeah, that happens. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay. He was like, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, man, the best you can do is just kind of throw out everything you believe and start over from scratch. Just yeah, go go idea by idea and decide what you believe and what you don't believe. Not bad advice. Not bad advice. Uh, but I, I got to the throw out everything you believe part and, uh, that's where I remain. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, that's that was you it. T- that's you today. That was that's it. Too. But I think in a way I am still doing that. Go yeah. idea by idea and decide what I believe and don't believe. Yeah. Okay. Personally. Well, so, I hope so. Yeah. I went through a process like that too. when I was like 19, 18 or 19 where I threw out everything I believed and I started over, uh, the first thing that I realized I didn't believe in was the prayer of salvation, which is this mm-hmm. idea that if you pray and mm-hmm. ask Jesus in your heart, then you'll be saved. Even as a Christian, I was like, then this isn't biblical. This doesn't seem right. So I walked away from that. And that's when I started. I didn't read any book but the Bible for two years. Um, and then I came Oof. out. Um, I came out as, as you know, I was, as I was at the last stage of my Christianity. I was like very reformed. I was very mm-hmm. much into Calvinism. I love John Piper. I think um, I remember when you were doing that, when you were oh, I definitely just do. reading the Bible. And I was like, I thought it was real cool at the time. Yeah. In hindsight, because we I'm worked like, at Christian oh, bookstores at the time. And so yeah. it was easy to get your hands on All kinds this of, study Bible and that or whatever. You know, um, I, I, I feel like this is really kind of a pivotal point because when you are, when you are, in church culture, there's this, it's like so important that we critically analyze everything that we believe, right? Mm -hmm. That we're constantly going back to our core beliefs or our whatever system of beliefs that we've built, whether you're liberal or conservative or, or Buddhist or Christian or whatever. Um, there's this need to constantly like bounce what we're learning off of our experiences or, or bounce what we believe off of our experiences and when you're in, when you're immersed in church in church culture, there really isn't room to do that. Absolutely, it's it's discouraging. I mean, in, in fact, in some, then rare occasions, I think there are churches that are that are comfortable with that. But for the most part, you can't. And even if the church is comfortable with it, you still really can't get much past like uh, Jesus was God and he ro- and he rose from the dead. Like mm-hmm. at the very bare minimum, you have to believe that, <laughs> right? You know, and you can't like throw that. Like if you question that, that throws your entire worldview into chaos. Whereas like now I feel like I have several different sort of pillars that are the base of my worldview. And if I need to like totally tear one down, I'm a lot more comfortable yeah. doing that, you know? Yeah. And that's why I think this interaction with this pastor was so transformative and why he was asked to leave the church was right. he was telling kids, teenagers to, to throw everything away. And that's question. something, yeah, yeah. And that's something that's really discouraging. You know, when you, when you are doubting, when you have doubt as a, especially as a kid in church, it's, you know, well, you just need to get with God and you need to pray and read your Bible. And the advice you really need is, Hey man, throw all that, kick all that shit to the curb and, you know, yeah. <laughs> figure out yeah, what's, yeah. Yeah. what's, what's real. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I want to go back to, you told two stories there. The first one was, mm-hmm. um, was about the, the pastor that, uh, that took you out and, and you fed some homeless people. Mm-hmm. Same guy. And he was the same guy. Okay, yeah. cool. And he was, uh, and he was like, you know, we don't need to like make this all about, about, you know, witnessing mm-hmm. quote unquote, we can just do a good deed. Yeah. Right? Uh, so how does that, how does that story and how does that experience, um, and what, what that pastor said, how does that, how does that play into your leaving the faith? And why do you think, why does that story, why is that story important for you to tell as part of your leaving? Christianity. Yeah. So hmm, I I think that was probably one of the first moments that I realized like good, good deeds and good acts can just be what they are. Like you can just do things for other people and you can just help others and support others without there being this gotcha moment of 
Right. Hey, gotcha. oh, wow, hey, man. while I have you, um, right, right, kind of right. very death of a salesman, Arthur Miller, you know, like, yeah, okay. uh, yeah. foot, foot in the door of, Hey, since I gave you that hot dog, uh, let me talk to you about this thing that right. you've heard, like you're, like you're I guarantee now. you've it's heard a from a hundred other people. Yeah, absolutely. How many times a, a day do you, switch. you're right. How many times a day do you think a homeless person hears the story of salvation? You know, right. Probably. Because yeah. people are coming up to him and doing this dog and pony show. And so I think that's why it was so important to me was it was the first time that I really realized like um, if we are to be true followers of Christ and at this point in my life, I think follower of Christ just means to be a <laughs> upstanding citizen. Sure. Um, I sub in that word um, to be an upstanding citizen. You just can do nice things and support people and give people what they need. Yeah. You know, <sighs> What I hear you saying with this pastor in two different instances that he gave you permission for things that you wouldn't allow yourself to have permission for. One is to throw things out and start over. And two, just to do good for the sake of doing good. And I think those are both things that you maybe didn't feel like you were supposed to or allowed to do. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, here's a really weird thing about uh, Southern Baptist culture is that I... W- I, at several points in conversations, and once from the pulpit, heard that... Uh, and probably from me, if it's something bad. <laughs> that Catholics will not go to heaven. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because of uh, works-based yeah, faith. Right. That's why, Christian, or that's why Catholics won't go to heaven. So there was this whole thing wrapped up in it of, if I just do good works and don't do this whole Jesus speech then am I just like the Catholics? It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not yeah. enough. Yeah, you have to... Right. And I want to clarify that whenever you said Catholics aren't going to heaven, and I said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, that, you mean that was a thing you've heard that's before? A, yeah, no, we, were, <laughs> we, were, we were basically... We were taught, we were instructed not to trust Catholics. We and hold not to trust no specific anybody. Christian doctrine on this podcast, <laughs> except, except that except Catholics that are not Catholics going, to are going to hell. <laughs> or at least purgatory. And that's I a, don't believe in hell, but for Catholics, it does exist. <laughs> and okay. isn't that such a weirdly Absolutely specific it, 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 Southern it was, Baptist for thing? For us, it was very much Catholics. We, we weren't supposed to, to, to like or trust Catholics because of our beliefs in Mary. And also if anybody spoke in tongues. That they were yeah, out, yeah, yeah, right, that too. Way, way oh my God, yeah. so bizarre. So I... for me, what I when I hear you tell that story, I I, I think uh, for me it's like it's about uh, there's this thing where we do when you're a Christian, you do a good deed, mm-hmm. and it is for God, but it's almost for your own standing as a Christian. It's like you're it's sort of like you're you're trying to earn a Christian. It's, the video, it's the video game thing, the the it leveling is, up the, thing. Yeah, it is. You're yeah. trying to level up and it's it it's almost impossible not to do it for yourself because you feel obligated to do it because the Bible teaches you that you should do it. And when you're not when you're outside of that, you can just do a thing for a person mm-hmm. and and it's for them. And there's it's yeah. like but it was so ingrained into that culture. And I think it was one of those things that it's even though it was not explicitly said, mm-hmm. no, right. Hey, you need to prove yourself. Uh, this As a matter way, of fact, it was there. they would, if anything, like in terms of doctrine, they would say, well, no, you don't need to prove yourself. Like, you know, salvation by grace. Right. Yeah. But socially and culturally but, you did. <laughs> right. Yes. No, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. And, and that's sort of the, that's sort of the devil in the details, I think is like, you you fall into this mindset, but all of the rhetoric is telling you something else. Well, I mean, for 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 goodness sake, the the church that kicked me out was the same church that I heard more about grace and forgiveness and acceptance from the pulpit right. from ever. Yeah, but but yeah, yeah. But then your behavior I questioned their was not acceptable, and they did not extend grace to you in that moment. Exactly, and that's the whole thing. Is if in the Southern Baptist world, if my whole thing is to win souls and I'm trying to win souls for Christ, then why wouldn't I take every opportunity with every good deed I do to say, hey, by the way, let me tell you about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, if if you're, it's like an athletic thing. Like, if that's the touchdown. Mm -hmm. So with every gain of yards, you're trying to get the touchdown Mm -hmm. rather than just gaining the yards. Right. Let me ask you this. What other, just kind of like, cultural ideas and mindsets did you notice were kind of passed on even though they weren't explicitly put there 
But the thing is that you can get a room full of Christians say, okay, was this ever in a sermon? And they would say yeah. no. But was this part of our culture? And they would all say yes. Yeah. You know, what other things were kind of passed around and how? Well, I think a big thing for me growing up is that I didn't have a dad. Like I didn't have a father figure. Well, I had father figures sort of, but I didn't have a dad. That's okay. <laughs> that's the main thing. Um, And so I, I was taking cues on masculinity from my friends uh, that were my same age because they were basically mimicking their dad's behavior. So I was like getting trickle down fatherhood. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of those ideas like really subtle, really murky waters around misogyny and okay. uh, homophobia and stuff like that. Like um, gender roles were a big thing that was kind of passed down. Definitely not explicitly, but you know, women or women raise the kids and women do, you know, Hey, can I get some guys over here to help carry these boxes? Hey, can I get some guys over here to set up these chairs and stuff like that? And um, mm. so I think, Definitely a big part of it for me was in this search for what is masculinity and what does it mean and what is it to be a guy. Um, I turned to some of those male church leaders and yeah. my friend's dads um, who kind of practice this um, almost primitive tribal kind of uh, gender roles thing mm -hmm. and homophobia thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the homophobia was not quite as subtle. It was pretty out there. Was it? Um, yeah. Were you Were you still a Christian when I came out? No. No. Okay. Okay. Why did I say something problematic no, no. to you? I was wondering. <laughs> okay. I was wondering what your like response was when that happened. No, I think because... that was. In fact, I think that was one of the times I reached out to you because you did the big Facebook post thing and it caused a firestorm in your comments. Yeah. And I sent you a personal message and said, like, hey, dude, love you, you know, proud of okay. you, stuff like that. I appreciate it. Um, of course, I like to paint my own narrative of how I responded to <laughs> Brady. No, that's how I remember <laughs> okay, you cool. responding. Um, so, yeah, I think that's definitely some of the passed down stuff that um, gets kind of, uh, I guess it gets sort of talked about. But especially when you talk about, like, our sociopolitical landscape and... Um, the Christian right and how they mobilize around ideas and stuff like that. It is all very much rooted in masculinity yeah. and oh. misogyny and homophobia and uh, uh, quote unquote pro-life kind of things. And so, so a big theme for us, Chuck was wild at heart. Did you ever read that book? Oh yeah. Ooh. With masculinity. Cause I, you know, I had my, a bad my copy of, of wild at heart. I picked it up one day and there was a cockroach in it Oh, and I smashed it inside the book and for a while, I was upset about that, but now I think it's kind of funny. It improved it, maybe. It's a metaphor. <laughs> it is a metaphor. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the uh, uh, cap Captivated, the uh, the female companion mm -hmm. uh, version. Yeah. I read that so I know how to talk to my girlfriends. Yeah. I had to learn one way or another. Um, when we get back, uh, we're going to take a short break, but I want to touch on a little bit more of this other mindset you had, because uh, Caleb, you are a very politically minded person. Yeah. And that's... Um, and I want to hear how you are now in your mindset now compared to what it was uh, growing up in an environment that you had. Uh, so stick with us right after this and we'll be right back. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you- Stop. Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> the lifeafter.org. We have a blog contact page a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back. Uh, we are here with Caleb and Chuck. And Caleb, one thing I've noticed about your story that I appreciate is the fact that you did not have this big traumatic, you know, uh, run away from Jesus moment. It's going to come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mine, mine was mine was crazy, but I don't... I always felt like even in church, like there was this idea that if you don't have this big dramatic story, then it's, you're, you're not really going to mean that much to people. So you right. kind of like learn to like tell your story in a certain way where it sounded cooler than it really was. Yeah. Even though you were just brought up in the church. Yeah. Right. I, I'm yeah, a, str yeah. I'm a straight white guy. I had to literally invent a testimony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think a lot yeah, of our you listeners... You can really run with the didn't have a dad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a good one. That's, good. that's then, hardship. That I found the Lord. Right, right. No, but I think a lot of our listeners are going to appreciate that because I, not all of us come from those weird 
crazy backstories. Yours was literally somebody told you, hey, it's okay to not believe this stuff. Figure out what you do believe. And you just did that. Yeah, yeah. And so your big change was was more about your ideologies and your your political views and how you view the world and your worldview. Absolutely. Um, tell us that transition. How did that look like for you? Yeah, so that's a big thing that I'm definitely still experiencing. So um, there was the years of church where conservatism was kind of the the way of the land, mm-hmm. um, and you just that's what you do because that's what you're told, which is interesting because Jesus was a socialist, but. Anyway, we'll get into that more. But later. Killed, in the church that we went to, um, Jerry Falwell yeah. visited before. Yeah. And had to bring mm-hmm. security guards because it was in the middle of the whole The bi- the Big Jerry. The Tinky Winky. Visited. Actually, like, that's a great yeah. nickname for him. The Big Jerry. The Big Jerry. <laughs> but it was in the middle of the whole Tinky Winky Teletubbies controversy. He had to bring guards with him yeah. to oh, speak from the gosh. pulpit at our church. Yeah. And I remember there were times that our pastor would welcome political guests mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. we would all clap and cheer for them mm-hmm. because they were Republican right. uh, politicians from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's why, you know, that's still something that I'm experiencing. So I had the the years of conservatism and then the years in between where I was not in church anymore. So at the end of high school, beginning of college, I wasn't in church anymore, just kind of floating around. And then I, the group of friends that I got in with in college was where the real big turn happened, and I became a huge, raging, uh, bleeding heart liberal. Mm-hmm. Um, a snowflake, if you a will. Snow, a, little, a little special <laughs> snowflake. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing I think of when I look at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's that's the big change that's, that's also still happening. Um, mm. But... Uh, the the big that big change is rooted in um, like we were saying in the last segment talking about this kind of subtle misogyny and homophobia and all that stuff that I look back on it now and I'm like oh that was I really believe those things I really believed mm-hmm. being gay was wrong and women were had their place in society mm-hmm. and you know uh, abortion was murder and all this stuff and I mean women do have their place in society. It's, but you're saying it's like, right next to me. <laughs> what I'm saying is a lesser, a lesser, yeah, but yeah, 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 yes. yeah, like a very like defines like women right. only can do this. Men right, can right, only do that. Right. right, vice right. Versa, right. I hope that was implied. It was. It was um, so, so I guess the, the big change is, is realizing I, I think I've become, I know I've become a, a more loving, caring person as a non-Christian than I was mm-hmm. as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, my morality is much more nebulous and relaxed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before it was very defined, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not right. okay. Um, but now realizing that people are people. To a and, fault, right? Like, Oh, you, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, like there were so many rules that it, it was impossible to, to make room for a good thing to happen. In, well, you know. And, and I think another important thing is uh, in college, I, I studied sociopolitical communication, um, which is basically, it's the study of political messaging mm-hmm. um, and kind of how how we construct political messages and how we disseminate those messages to our voter base. Um, okay. So in, in churches, at least in my experience, we put straightness and whiteness and masculinity into these power structures where mm. if you're gay, wow, it's wrong. Yeah. If you're trans, it's wrong. If you X, Y, Z, you know, any number yeah, of things are yeah, wrong. Yeah. And uh, the apex is white maleness. Yeah. And everything else is is trying to get there. Right. And if you're not trying to get there, you're doing it wrong. Right. And so obviously it's just this like microcosm or macrocosm even because it's huge right. um, yeah. power structure where where those ideas are kind of perpetuated um, and, and it just becomes really toxic. Um, but it's never, in my experience, it's never really explicit. Well, okay. I want to touch on that about the whiteness. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really- no, so we're going to touch on this in a, in a future episode. I've got a friend, uh, she's black and she's has some experiences that she's going to share with us. And I'm really looking forward to that. But I very specifically remember there being a family discussion at my house, uh, cause my brother, my older brother, he's four years older than me. His Sunday school teacher made an illustration in Sunday school class that just as the blue Jays and Cardinals don't mix, 
neither should we. Oh, oh my God. As a racist. Oh, that is um, insane. Wow. And so it, it isn't always explicit. And of course, that's one Sunday school teacher, and he cannot represent no, all of Southern Baptist. Not, but yeah. it was not until, not even within the last two years, that the Southern Baptist Convention finally voted yeah. to not fly yeah. the Confederate flag. Right, right, right. right okay? Yeah. Like, so yeah, we could say that it's not explicit, but it is. But, it yeah. but it's yeah. not. Right. But it is. You yeah. know what I mean? It's it's explicit in so far as it's acceptable. It it it's they can't say they're racist. And yeah. when you mentioned homophobia, growing up in that in that environment it, it, as as a as a kid who was struggling with being gay, right? Um, it really did hit me of how many times I heard homophobic slurs sure and it was a part of the thing and and it was just always a joke that she would be into guys or effeminate or all of these things and i don't think i really can grasp how much that messed with me growing up well yeah. it, it really know? is toxic masculinity at its core yeah. um and it, it, it's all steeped in that and i think particularly the racism is really interesting because as as flimsy as they are people can try and make the argument against um, against the LGBT community with the Bible, and they can make mm-hmm. the argument against abortion with the Bible, but with race, it's weird. <laughs> like it doesn't make it's, sense. It's it's a real yeah. subtle anti-blackness, anti-color. Right. But you can't back that up with the Bible. You have to ignore the fact that everybody in the Bible is brown. Right. And Jesus is brown. And that Jesus is brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that probably a lot of people are are very dark skinned Africans. Right. And it, that I think is a product of the the Bible Belt. As a matter of fact, there are probably very few white people. Yeah, yeah. referenced in Scripture, if any. Right. There. Uh, it wasn't until I was like in my college age that I heard uh, racism explicitly denied biblically. Um, mm. it, I was in Minnesota. I was actually visiting John Piper's church and the school there, and there was um, somebody who was like a big uh, advocate for racial diversity and racial equality and uh, he he did like a whole speech on it and i remember it blew my mind because mm-hmm. i was just like mm-hmm. wow this is so yeah. true this is so good mm-hmm. and a lot of it is is stuff that i still is so deeply ingrained in me from church and from my you know kind of extended family is these like on the surface kind of harmless maybe statements but um this like uh, you know, if we're going downtown to pass out food to homeless people, like, hey, you guys, make sure you don't go Fear. in certain areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And why is that? Because mm-hmm. there's more black people there. That's right. why. And so that those things are like very deeply ingrained in me where I will be in the city somewhere, like driving by myself or like when I was parking outside your house, Chuck. Mm-hmm. And I just Ooh, instinct instinctively, I like looked around and was like, just is this yeah. a safe neighborhood? Right. right. And I was like, "What the hell am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, right, yeah. It's just people live here. Yeah. And, it, and it's not. Yeah. I don't. People are gonna hear stuff like this and they're gonna think, "Oh, well, those people on the podcast are under the impression that like all these Christians got together and they like ruined their little hands and they're like, oh, you know, who should we pick on next? Oh, I know the gays or the blacks. Yeah. You know, and that's not the case at all. It's no. just the no. fact that when these things are so much of the culture, it's and, systemic. And, it's yes, and and it yeah. blends in together yeah. and it starts to become one movement instead of two separate ones sometimes yeah. or they the, the lines would get very fuzzy right um but it's real it's absolutely yeah. real that experience your experience is real and your experience matters right and so this this turn into liberalism was my big turn away from from the church because i would come home on holidays or during the summer from college and try and get back together with old church friends and you know, they would just say something offhand about Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, oh, crap, I totally forgot you guys are like, yeah, you guys still, like hate yeah. Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, like, yeah, it's it's like it's like a little bit like, oh, yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, we're back so, at this time in our life. Right, yeah. So right, I yeah. I mean, over the years, especially in the last year and a half, two years, really stopped hanging out with those people because you couldn't there wasn't anything that I could talk about that they weren't like weird about. That makes sense. And right, like being, right. being a progressive was became so much of my identity that I didn't have anything in common with the people in my hometown anymore. Mm-hmm. 
where it was like, Mm -hmm. there are very few people that I can talk to without, you know, you're always going to stumble across some idea and they'll, they'll say their belief and you're like, Oh my God, I, like, I forgot that we used to believe this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've experienced that. Yeah. I remember being a conservative Christian and hearing, I I had like heroes that were liberal. Like Mm -hmm. I loved Tina Fey and she was this huge feminist. And Mm -hmm. you know, there was like a lot of these other actors and actresses that wanted to like and respect. And in my heart of hearts, I was like, I really agree with them and I want to be able to do it, but I, I can't, Mm -hmm. you know? And it wasn't until finally when I walked away from the faith where I'm just like, Oh, I'm free to believe these things now. I'm free to believe that women are able to do whatever they want so that they should be treated equal or right. that should be paid equal. I can finally I can, you know, love and trust trans people yeah. and bisexuals and gays. Yeah. So it was like finally I gave myself that permission right. and was able to embrace that. And it was it for me, it was almost overnight that when I was able to let go of those things, I'm like, Oh, I'm very left leaning. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that was I always, Whole new territory. I always wonder, because this, this goes back to me not being a very good Christian. One of the things I always did was I would listen to whatever music I wanted and watch whatever I wanted oh, on yeah, TV. Was, and, yeah. you know, ACDC, Led Zeppelin. I was a big classic rock kid, yeah, weird, yeah. nerdy. You were. With, the, um, with, this, with this backwards satanic Yeah, messages. yeah. But it, it always yeah. makes me wonder, like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it always makes me wonder, like... How how do conservatives consume art? Because they have art. to make their own. They yeah, their and own. they have bad. to make their own it's post-apocalyptic bad. movie right. starring right. Uh, Mr. T right, right, right. and Kurt Cameron. I remember um, I had a um, I had a chart. Actually, one of the <laughs> this is actually pretty funny. Uh, one of the ways that I started getting into good secular music was a chart. That they used to have it at a local bookstore. Oh that was, no! It was if you like Christian, this, then try this. Mu- Christian yeah, it music. was like if you if you like these secular artists, try this Christian music. <laughs> you went backwards. Backwards. <laughs> backwards. <laughs> That's awesome. I had man, I had so many. I just recently was like talking to my mom about this for the first time. Like I had any just and the worst, you know, the worst music. I had Eminem. I had Limp Bizkit. Yeah, I had, like, eat that hell relevant. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was hilarious. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. That made my day. But, but now I, it, it was so, it was so good because now I, I, music is my life. And if I hadn't, oh yeah, so that, good came out of it. If I hadn't yeah. made that transition, I, I don't know where I, I honestly don't know where I'd be in life. Honestly, yeah, exactly. Because music has saved my life a few times. Yeah. So I, I think a big part of that turn for me is realizing that. Um, that loving people and taking care of people and supporting people is not owned by Christianity. Exactly. It, it it's it's an idea that that spans religions and spans ideologies and that sort of thing. And uh, if if Christianity is something you want to get behind and you want to be a follower of Christ and you want to, you know, uh, win most Christ like in your a basketball league, <laughs> then you should be a socialist <laughs> and you should be yeah, a, a yeah. liberal because, um, th- you know, those are the people, uh, historically and, and it seems to be the trend that are taking care of others and yeah. reaching out to others. And, you know, Finding we, people where they're at. we want universal health care and we want to legalize gay marriage and et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I think it, the three of us could sit and talk about uh, niche uh, Christian authors forever, but um, for me, somebody like Shane Claiborne or like Rob Bell, mm-hmm. who kind of really touched on those ideas of loving people um, and, yeah. and, um, in, in, yeah, in yeah, practical author, ways. Author of Irresistible Revolution for anybody that doesn't. Shane Claiborne. Like, yeah, yeah, Shane Claiborne. So th- there was something you said earlier that, that really sparked a, th- a thought into me, and that was... Uh, when we were very conservative and politically minded and all of this, it was like we wanted to please a God who I don't believe is there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I identify as atheist now, but it's, so we, I, I, I tried so hard to please a God who wasn't there that I was forgetting about the people who actually were there in mm-hmm. front of me. Yeah, the the different people the that, ones uh, that are cast have, aside. The, uh, you're so heavenly bound, you're no earthly good. Have you heard that phrase? Oh wow, no, but I like yeah, that. Yeah, it's a, wow. well, yeah. because isn't that easier? Isn't it easier for fat, white, straight people who go to church in the suburbs to just go to church every Sunday and hear their good word, and maybe every once in a while they say something to their coworkers about Jesus? But you know, isn't it easier to do that than going out in, in the streets and 
you know, really making connections with people. True. And, and but there are other Christians who do that and they're great. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, like those were some of the people that influenced my life a lot. Right. They're the ones that actually did meet the the rubber met the road. And I would mm-hmm. say I'm looking at the pastor that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um and Caleb, I mm, to see who you've grown up to be and who you are, um it is encouraging to me and it is amazing to me. Uh, of how we started in the same place and we've gone through this really weird journeys, uh, separate journeys, but now yeah. here we are <laughs> together again and, and with the same mindset and beliefs and, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Yeah. I'm this encouraged is the full by... house moment of the podcast. Uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> the Danny Tanner <laughs> moment. Please add uh, some violin. Bring some, yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's no, but, be, uh, uh, yeah. but yeah. another, another good Christian that I'm thinking of that was on your way was definitely this pastor who, who gave you the ability and the, the permission to listen to your doubts. Sure. His advice was not throw them out. His advice mm-hmm. was listen to them and let them play their, their way through. Yeah, absolutely. What other positive things um, came out of your Christian world? Um, I think a lot of, um, a lot of friendships, a lot of social, social skills. Um, despite taking my masculinity cues from other people's dads, I did, uh, learn how to socialize in a lot of different environments. Um, I'm glad those men were there for you. Yeah, I am too. And, and it wasn't, they weren't entirely, you know, I think it was a net positive on those interactions. Mm-hmm. Um, in spite of what you, what we've talked about, about po- toxic masculinity and homophobia. Yeah. Because a lot of that is, is uh, retrospective. Sure. Like I realize how misogynist things were now mm-hmm. as a, as a person who knows those things. But back then they were nurturing environments where we, we laughed and we threw a football around and we mm-hmm. played they video games. Cared. They cared. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely cared. And so I think that's a big part of it. And, and also just learning how to socialize and make people laugh I mean, comedy has been a thread through my whole life. You know, my mom raised me on the SNL Best of Chris Farley VHS that I I put up, you know, I ran out because I, I played it so much. And like like Brady said earlier, you know, that this hierarchy of our youth group was very humor-based and very comedy-based. And um, going into now, realizing that making people laugh is such a great way to connect, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that's a constant through my whole life. Um, the humor is a little less family friendly now, but uh, it still it still uh, gathers, I think. And you're you're on your way. You're moving. You're in the transition to moving to Chicago. Yeah. What are your plans there? Yeah. Um, I'm moving there with three buddies from college. Uh, three of the guys that turned me into a liberal, raging liberal, <laughs> and <laughs> right. we are going to um, do some some classes, hopefully, at the wonderful improv theaters in Chicago and do stand up and sketch writing and anything we can get our hands on. Um, but just having that environment and that, that kind of, uh, having that fellowship with those guys, I think is going to be really great. Fellowship. Oh my gosh. That there's word. A, there's a positive takeaway <laughs> the word fellowship. Trigger yeah. warning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fellowship is just hanging out when Christians do it. Yeah, there we go. It's yeah. The breaking of bread. Yeah. Right. It's just chilling. Caleb, it's, it's Christian chilling. <laughs> chillin like Christians can always find a way to make something lame. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, you want to chill? Well, I don't know if Christians really chill. It's that poster. Fellowship? If you really like uh, Fallout Boy, you'll <laughs> love Skillet. Skillet. <laughs> this worst version. You'll love yes! Hawk Nelson. Hawk Nelson. You'll love Hawk Nelson. This worst oh version. God. Over the world. <laughs> Tooth and nail. Well, Tooth the nail records. Alien you alien you never mind. Just, oh my gosh. just gonna Caleb, I want to thank you so much for um being on the show with us yep. and yep. sharing your stories with too. us. Um I'm encouraged by it. I'm glad to hear that there's good that came out of it, that you're going to Chicago, you're gonna, you know, do your comedy and all of that. Um I really do appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. And uh God bless and God bless America. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> I'm so sorry. God bless America. <laughs> Listening to Brady and Caleb talk reminds me that we're all on a journey together. Sometimes when we're making these huge transitions like getting married or moving away or leaving a religion, we feel like we're losing people. The context for relationships change and some of those relationships stop functioning and that can be really hard. 
But today's conversation reminds me that you're always going to find someone who is traveling the same journey. Whether it's reuniting after a long time like Brady and Caleb and finding out you still have a lot in common, even though you've both changed worldviews. Or if it's making new friends and connections like the ones Brady and I have been making through this podcast. We will always find our people if we're willing to look and be honest and a little vulnerable. There are deep connections to be made and then lost and then remade and sometimes that's difficult. But I tend to believe that we will find our way back to each other. Thanks for listening. I'm Chuck Parson. This is The Life After. Mm -hmm.